Overwatch 2, an all-new sequel to the world-famous, world-igniting Overwatch 1 that was set to introduce an all-new PvE and Hero Mode component to the game in a way never done before. Well, that was the tagline and the thesis of it all. That's not where things ended up, as all of you are probably well aware of after reading the title of this video. No, you see, it turns out after the game has been reportedly in the works since 2019, Overwatch 2 has been basically cancelled. Yes, there will be fans in chat discussing how the PvP mode is still existing and counters this notion, but the entire point of Overwatch 2 was the new PvE hero mode and content. Hundreds of missions, hero missions, and cooperative content, mostly if not all, gone. And yet, here we are. Blizzard is seemingly bent on pretending that nothing happened, with their recent showcase at the Xbox Game Show where they unveiled their paid PvE content and teased a new hero. But I won't pretend it didn't happen. I was there testing Overwatch since closed beta, and I got to top 500 and even won a LAN tournament. I was in the trenches, and seeing the foregoing of development on Overwatch 1 for another game was puzzling even back then. If this is Overwatch 2, a major sequel, it might be one of the worst, highest profile ones we have ever seen and witnessed, all things encompassed. This is quite clearly Detectives a special episode. I mean, I've already got the jazz going, and I don't even think we have ever gone through a timeline like this before, with such preconceived notions of chaos and failure wrapped up so deeply into everything. But that's because Overwatch 2 was a colossal failure, and despite what White Knighters in the comments might try, keyword, to argue, this entire video is going to be dedicated to outlining through the usage of the game's historical timeline and evidence we gather along the journey, the various failures of the game culminating to a colossal one just recently. So strap in, detectives, we have quite the story to unravel here. To disclaim things too, my allegiances are to the betterment of the gaming industry as a whole. To everyone asking me to be less mean or critical, well, I'm just letting you know that that's utterly trite and not utility-like in reaching my goal. Detectives have never really been universally liked. I mean, we're shaking cupboards and pulling back rugs after all. Anyway, thanks for the support as always. You guys personally requested this investigation, so let's get to the case. I'd like to welcome this video's sponsor and an upcoming Kickstarter project already listed on Steam, Ned Iron Outlaw. Based loosely on the story of the Australian bush ranger legend Ned Kelly and the Kelly Gang. I was approached by Beer Labs or Brood Engagement Extended Reality Labs, a really cool name, concerning giving my short impressions on the upcoming game and project after playing the demo on Steam. Ned Iron Outlaw is an indie game, and I'm all for supporting indie developers trying to make it the right way. To be honest, I had no idea what to expect. I've done sponsored games before in ads, but never one where the ad was just me playing the game and talking about my experiences. I think this shows a good amount of trust in the product itself, but also just generally more honesty as a developer. I wasn't given anything specific to cover, so I'm gonna talk about what I liked and found most interesting in Ned Iron Outlaw. First off, Ned is an action metrovania style game where you move side to side and up and down across various environments and platforms, defeating the enemies you encounter along the way. The unique parts about the game are certainly the setting. I haven't personally played a game set in Australia with zombies and monsters and creatures roaming the environment. Ned Kelly and his gang were also real fighters, real figures, near folk legends at this point in Australian history, and seeing their stories featured in this game was both unique and interesting for me. I really enjoyed the loading screens and moments where you get the chance to read biographical cards designed for each of the key members of the story. I would like more chances to try out Ned Iron Outlaw. And if you feel the same way and or want to support Australian indie video game development, please visit the website link at nedgame.com.au listed in the description and top comment. I also included the Kickstarter link so you can put your email down and know when that launches as well. Stay tuned for more information about Ned Iron Outlaw from the website, and thanks to Beer for sponsoring this video with Ned Iron Outlaw. Let's get back to the mystery, detectives. The story of Overwatch 2 unsurprisingly starts with the previous title, Overwatch 1. The mere announcement of a sequel would send shockwaves through the community. Not just because of the hype and possibilities, but because Overwatch 1 was only a few years old at this point, and at that point had been largely abandoned in terms of large or even moderate updates. 
This much was admitted by Overwatch's director Jeff Kaplan later on, but the whole idea was that Overwatch 1 was on the rocks because the development team was secretly cooking up Overwatch 2 behind the scenes, and it was going to change everything. Overwatch 2 would be finally capitalizing on the long-standing and incredibly well-done lore and art that Overwatch featured for many years, including the trailers and the different shorts. With the addition of the game now having a story mode, they could really leverage this. This would include story missions, unique hero missions for each hero, and according to Forbes, Overwatch 2 was set to have reportedly hundreds of co-op missions. As for the PvP players, they would experience new visuals, a new game mode dubbed Push, new heroes, and the change of 6 players to 5 players now, making the game 5 vs 5. Nearly two years would pass and Overwatch 2 was seemingly no closer to launch. While it's expected for a game to have taken time for development, announcing it clearly so early on was putting pressure on the game. And worse, Overwatch 1 wasn't being updated or properly handled anymore. So much so that Blizzard was even admitting such. Worst of all, not only was the development on Overwatch 2 stalling, behind the scenes, struggles over scope and scale on the project were raging on. The game director himself, Jeff Kaplan, the voice and face of Overwatch, would be leaving Blizzard during this struggle after 19 years of development history. Aaron Keller, who previously led the level design team on Team 4 for Blizzard and Overwatch, would take over as the game director. Funny enough though, his LinkedIn still says that he's a level designer though. Jeff Kaplan leaving was a major blow to not just Overwatch, but the coming of Overwatch 2. Many people would theorize that Overwatch 2 was Jeff's plan and vision to the realization, to see the realization of what was Project Titan, the previously failed online FPS project that from its ashes would birth Overwatch. Many people felt that with his departure, that dream officially died. That being said, there is also an insane amount of character worship that goes on in America, and specifically with Jeff Kaplan. Now, it's less that he's secretly this bad developer that I'm going to unveil, or this asshole, or whatever else, but it's more that just that his strengths also come with weaknesses. And for the kind of game and money that Activision Blizzard was trying to make, perhaps Jeff was just the wrong tool. With more time and resources, could Jeff maybe have accomplished his vision? Perhaps, but the deck was stacked against him ever since Kotick took over Blizzard. And well, after you see of what became of the monetization for Overwatch 2, it's hard not to see it as a battle that Kaplan ultimately lost, whatever the true story might be. While 2021 would be a quiet year for Overwatch 2 and its coming progress, it wasn't a quiet year for the developer and publisher behind the game, Activision Blizzard. In the summer of 2021, multiple harassment suits would be levied against the company with real credible backing and evidence. The California Department of Fair Employment and Housing would release a 29-page complaint sheet following two years of research concerning dozens of accounts of sexual harassment at Activision Blizzard. Activision Blizzard, from all accounts and purposes, was a toxic frat boy culture who had become so powerful and big-headed in their success in video games that the company felt that they could just display their misogyny and bro culture at the workplace. Brazenly, even. The chickens were coming home to roost, though. The backlash was so bad that the major advertisers that were involved in the OWL, or the Overwatch League, were pulling out by the fall of 2021. Now this could be seen as convenient timing as the pro scene and the viewership numbers therein weren't very impressive, but when major advertisers don't want to associate with you anymore, it means that you're losing in the eye of the public. Despite all the developmental drama and drama surrounding the development itself, Overwatch 2 would continue on with a closed beta April 26, 2022. The launch date was also announced for later in the year in October. There was also more details concerning the switch to 5 vs 5 and how that would now only feature one tank. The biggest drama yet concerning Overwatch 2 itself, not Activision Blizzard and the development team, would be related to the monetization of the game. Due to European law and pressure globally, Activision Blizzard was forced to redo their approach with loot boxes. This was a perfect opportunity for them to devise a new scheme to make money off of their customers, new or old. With the Battle Pass system, new heroes like the support character Kiriko would now be locked behind requiring players to greatly progress through it and or purchase the Battle Pass. To make matters worse, people did the math on how long it would take to grind both Kiriko herself and all of her cosmetics, and the math was staggeringly high, reportedly taking five years of grinding at a normal pace to complete. Previously, Overwatch was a box price with loot boxes for skins, but to be honest, as a longtime player, most of the other longtime players like me already had most of the skins that they wanted without having to spend money. With the new system, heroes would be locked behind a paywall, bringing a different sort of monetization the game had never seen before. In competitive shooters, hero shooter or not, players have felt that locking a champion or a hero behind a paywall isn't fair due to needing to play with, as them, or against them in ranked play. It makes the game feel more like pay to win, to put simply. 
And Blizzard's reasoning for locking heroes behind a paywall was simple, and they even admitted it quite clearly. Because it was the single most engaging content. They knew exactly what they were doing and why they were doing it, and how it was skewed to making them more money. More bad news would strike in September of 2022 in the way of losing more key important talent. This time, the lead hero designer, Jeff Goodman. Jeff not only had been balancing and helping create heroes since the original game came out, he was responsible for the most recent reworks of Orisa, Doomfist, as well as the new heroes that were added to the game. To say losing him was a major blow was an understatement. And no reason was given as to why he departed either, just like Jeff Kaplan, trending towards problems behind the scenes, right? Overwatch 2 would launch October 4th, 2022 after nearly three to four years in development in parallel as they were maintaining the live services on Overwatch 1. The critical reviews, which is what we will start with, were probably as expected, glossing over many of the negative aspects we covered in the pregame in lieu of focusing on the game itself. I will talk more about the player reception of the game later. PC Gamer in their review of Overwatch 2 would score the game a 74 out of 100 and state that Overwatch 2 could have launched as a much better game and a much more ambitious one. Like the original in 2016, it could have been an FPS for the sort of players and skill sets that other shooters don't often make room for. Instead, it's a confusing sequel that sacrifices its best parts as it transitions to a free-to-play model. The original Overwatch is too robust and too distinct to be completely erased, and it's why the sequel remains compelling in spite of itself. But the live service model leaves it in a fragile state. Close as it is to a fully reinvigorated sequel to one of the best shooters of the last decade, it's just as close to collapsing as the pillars of its original design get knocked out. IGN was rather positive concerning Overwatch 2. Overwatch 2 breathes new life into what was once the sharpest multiplayer shooter around, before it had its edges severely dueled by Blizzard's attention shifting away. The switch to smaller 5v5 matches ushers in a new brawler age for Overwatch where individual duels take precedence over tactical team play. And crucially, all but a handful of shields have been thrown out of the arena. The fundamentals are all set for Overwatch to shine as it once did in the multiplayer shooter scene once again, and the future definitely looks bright with what is set to come over the following months. Leaving their review on a slight bit of a cliffhanger many people in the comments are probably chuckling about right now. Where the reviews actually start getting critical is with Eurogamer and Polygon's review of Overwatch 2, starting with Eurogamers. Going by its launch showing, I suspect Overwatch 2 will continue to stumble occasionally with its representational politics. The wider question is, where is it stumbling to? I'm not privy to the detail of Blizzard's forthcoming co-op modes, but let's be honest. We've seen Overwatch do PvE before, and it's never felt like more than a nice distraction. The PvP is still some of the best multiplayer you can find this side of Smash Bros and Team Fortress, but all of those incremental additions create a sense of dying by inches. I would rather play a proper Street Fighter 4-esque sequel which shucks off or transforms the original frameworks entirely. As things stand today, Overwatch 2 feels like yet another service game, where unlocks lead off into perpetuity, purely because money has to be made. It's got its eyes on the horizon, the same old spring in its step, but I'm not sure it has anywhere to go. While Polygon was not quick to jump to conclusions for the game, they were also worried about the game even being delivered as promised. Nailed it, Polygon. Enjoying Overwatch 2 is an exercise in cautious optimism, not just in the future direction of its ever-changing lore and world, but in the idea that years of new content will ultimately deliver on the promise of a full sequel. Overwatch 2, drama and all, would eclipse an impressive 35 million players. Mind you, the game was free to play now, so a higher player count was kind of to be expected, but still, that was something to work with and incredibly impressive. But how long would those players stick around for? On top of a normal online gaming bleed, Overwatch 2's numbers would be dropping no matter what because the game was technically in early access. It was missing the promised PvE, which was the whole selling point of the game. At launch, Overwatch 2 was more focused on being this lean, slight overhaul shift from 6 vs 6 to 5 vs 5 PvP light experience. I say light experience because they didn't even fully commit to being competitive with the lack of tournament features in the game, still when compared to other top titles like Valorant. The fact with Overwatch 2 was that free to play now was a nice cushion for some of the criticism it was facing, but things were only going to get worse for the game. Things would worsen for Overwatch 2 concerning their professional scene, or the OWL, the Overwatch League. In December of 2022, OWL's Philly team, Fusion, would be rebranding and relocating to Korea as a Korean team in Seoul. Now this might seem like an incredibly random for people not following the OWL, which is most people, but during the pandemic, as I covered in my first video concerning Overwatch 1, the professional scene for Overwatch 1 was in turmoil. The entire premise of the league was to be like a traditional sports league, where major cities would have their own teams that must be franchised, aka purchasing a team slot to make a team. 
As much as many outlets would like to fluff the story for Activision Blizzard concerning the pandemic being the culprit for the esport dying, the truth is that the esport was never really alive in the first place. It was a forced esport that was artificially created. Activision Blizzard never let Overwatch grow competitively, organically. And the best times were in the original beta, because this is the time that we were organizing our own tournaments and doing things grassroots. When only a fraction of your population plays ranked, and even then a smaller fraction who does competitive gaming or watches it, it's going to be hard to build this entire traditional sports-like league concept. Especially when esports is online and trying to force local brand appeal into esports, it just doesn't really make sense. It straddles on borderline delusion when you realize that Activision Blizzard was promising its investors $125 million in revenue by 2020. That money was nowhere in sight. And viewership numbers had been on this steady decline minus the launch event of Overwatch 2 itself naturally. Yet franchise slots were still costing $20 million. Where was the money? Where were the viewerships? Because it wasn't in esports and it certainly wasn't in Overwatch. The reason that Fusion transitioning to Korea is a significant thing is that because the majority of the professional players and the general player base in Overwatch are Korean and in Korea. It means that the entire premise of the OWL in the US and the EU, where they have this massive important sponsorships and investors set up, it's basically becoming null and void, with competition moving to Korea for better pay and opportunities. I actually think that Activision Blizzard could kind of save the esports scene slightly by just leaning into this and creating an online GSL-like league like StarCraft had. I mean, can we point out more of the absurdity about the whole copy traditional sports thing? You might be thinking, like, oh, a Philly team moving to Korea, wow, that sounds like a TV show worthy experience, except that the team is freaking Korean. <laughs> But that's probably just a coincidence, right? What about my hometown city, the Houston Outlaws? Ah, okay. So best case scenario, Overwatch 2's eSport is still kicking, technically, just in Korea. At this point, it feels like Activision Blizzard just doesn't want to take their ball and go home for fear of that walk of shame. Because it's one thing to be optimistic, but when you don't have any results, it starts to tend towards delusion. Which is what I'm inclined to believe personally. I spoke about Overwatch as an esport in my previous Death of a Game, and to quickly address my personal beliefs on such, given my history with the game, I think Overwatch might have had the potential to become an esport, had they let the game grow organically. This is not just important in developing a scene who plays or watches the game, but also in developing the appropriate rule sets and game modes that people prefer. Instead, we were kind of all shoehorned into running with default modes that the game came with. That they ended up kind of removing for the second game, by the way. And these modes weren't really suited for competitive play. No other major shooter has them. And then there's this whole information overlord problem that I told you guys about previously, especially as a tank player who made it to top 500. For the vast majority of people watching Overwatch at a competitive, let alone pro level, they have no idea what's going on, even for experienced players. There's so many particle effects on screen and things going on between 12 players that it's overwhelming for the majority of players. When you compare this to traditional sports, it's a world of difference. You know that in basketball, when the ball lands in the hoop, it's a bingo. You get the idea. That's why Activision Blizzard was better off comparing esports to the UFC or MMA or something more avant-garde and less mainstream that had more unique rules and formats. How the UFC, as a lifelong martial artist who's been watching it since 2004, went about advertising to a broader audience was taking highly skilled and experienced commentators and having them break things down over time. Over the course of many years, this led to a, just a higher general education. The issue with Overwatch was actually concerning commentators, which, sure, there were some good ones like Reinforce, who was there since the inception of the game, playing competitive lobbies with us, so I know he had a high level of skill and knowledge, but the majority were just fans who didn't particularly understand the game very well. That's again, because most players playing Overwatch don't. Overwatch feels like you're playing TF2 or a MOBA in some cases, or even a classic competitive shooter. But the reality is you're playing a team-based game built on being a team plays game that was even built on the precipice of being an even more team-based game originally. But it's still built for being a team-based game. It's actually one of the most snowball-y games I've ever played because of the way it focuses on team fighting and team movement so much. Any top level player can back me up on this, but in Overwatch 1, once the first point was taken, if that team was able to wipe or charge their alts, it basically meant that if they were any good, GG for the second point, and this carried all the way up to pro level play. Overwatch 2 had this idea of reducing the amount of combatants to help combat problems of clarity and curb the balance in some ways. For example, reducing the amount of tanks and shields to speed the game up, and solve the problem of too many shields and too many tanks. 
Balance notwithstanding, though, just because, honestly, they've done so much balancing up and down on the game, I don't have a super strong opinion on which way it goes, except them just reworking some characters, which just ended up feeling, like, weird because, well, the game was still trying to appeal to casual players, so getting rid of Cassidy's flashbang just seems kind of strange. But I want to focus on what happened to the Overwatch formula itself. When a player was removed, specifically the tank, this not only reduces the amount of players, it reduces the amount of frontline presence and helps the other tanks and players. This makes it not only hard to play a tank in Overwatch 2, it means that it's harder for your team to play around a bad tank too. So a good tank is way more powerful, period. Tanks in Overwatch are initiators. They decide most of the time how the fight is started, especially with ults, and sometimes how it ends. It was hard playing as a tank in solo queue in 6 vs 6 because you had to coordinate with your team. Now imagine in 5 vs 5, if you're out of position, it means you're dead. And that means big problems for your team. While I personally like the change overall, I think for the large percentage of the population it wasn't a very good change. The idea of making Overwatch 2 less overpowered with abilities is something that I talked about slightly in my previous videos, and focusing more on the competitive aspects kind of makes sense in a sense, but not at this point, because all it does is further the problem of increasing the DPS queues, and the problem that the game already has regarding the flow of the game. It feels like you're doing backwards work, but where are you going at this point? I know that sounds strange, again, because I wanted the game to be more competitive with less of these overpowered abilities. But at this point, Blizzard already has nerfed the vast majority of hitscan in the game, and even completely nerfed some of the hitscan characters like Cassidy. The game is much slower as a result of many of these changes, which make the Switch to 5 vs 5 feel like a band-aid fix, or one that they weren't even fully done implementing. And I know they did it too because there was the problem of there being too many shields and too many tanks and, well, the part of the whole problem of lack of knowledge of the game was because in Overwatch 1 you're supposed to actually shoot at the shields a lot of the time, despite that not being fun or very intuitive. In Overwatch 2, now there wasn't a shield problem, but now tanks barely felt like they could take care of their team, and that was either a good thing depending on the kind of tank player you were, or a bad thing. Overwatch 2 would introduce their Season 3 February 27, 2023. With this season would be the introduction of a new quarterly battle pass, the Workshop, which would now allow for custom mapping and some new Mythic skins. Producer Jared Noose was dismissive slightly of fans clamoring for different game modes, expressing a need and desire to focus and balance and fix what was already currently there. The problem is, is that you released a new game, so people are going to be expecting new content, right? The first true major season, arguably, was Season 4, with the introduction of a new hero support in Lifeweaver, a new fan-made map, thanks to the workshop, and a few other bells and whistles. Season 4 felt like the perfect place for Overwatch 2 to be building momentum. It was problematic that they still hadn't brought in their promised matchmaking changes and fixes to the game, further hurting their ranked population. But looking back, April seemed like a good month for Overwatch 2 overall. I don't think anyone could really have imagined what would have happened the following month. A dagger of an announcement would hit the web May 16th, 2023. Overwatch 2's PvE hero mode with the RPG-like missions and progressions and talent tree system would be cancelled. Keller explained that the hero mode had been in development since Overwatch's launch in 2016 and that it apparently was part of the vision the team had for Project Titan, the cancelled FPS MMO from which Overwatch was born. Like the article states, the hero mode was a remnant of Project Titan, and it being cancelled was Keller and the team putting to bed the dream of Project Titan, period. The game director Keller basically stresses in his public statements that concerning the cancellation, that they had evaluated it and that it was just too difficult to do, and too difficult to do while maintaining development on the other part of the game. Now if I left my journalistic integrity or just general integrity where the writer of this article at The Verge and many other journalists left theirs, which is making excuses for a billion dollar corporation fumbling a launch and product, then yeah, I would just leave it there. But I won't. In fact, that's why I made this video. Overwatch 2 and Activision Blizzard, with the help of many diehard fans and an army of media lining up for the scoop, has controlled the narrative. I have already gotten comments on my stuff about it too. Comments saying, well, they always said that they were going to charge for the other PvE content missions. So they aren't doing anything wrong and didn't necessarily cancel the PvE, right? The idea is that Activision Blizzard or Team 4 is just a small moving team. It's an indie team who struggles with game development, resources, and talent. And that they couldn't do the things that they really wanted to do. And we should just accept that, that they're going to do their best going forward. Except they aren't a small team, and they aren't struggling in resources. <laughs> and the truth is, they lied to everybody, and sold us a game that wasn't complete, and was in early access. 
Now they are pivoting to what content they can deliver on and they are trying to control the narrative that it's not that bad. Or, or at least the fanbase and the media are doing it for them. But for reference, the hero missions in hero mode was reportedly going to be hundreds of missions. The main meat of the PvE mode. Them still releasing more story content isn't getting people excited, or shouldn't, because their previous story content at events hasn't even been that impressive anyway. And unless it's a strong departure from that, what are players really expecting? The following month, in June of 2023, Activision Blizzard would announce the paid story content portions at the Xbox Games Showcase. According to Game Informer, three missions would be released, and each of them would take up to 30 minutes to complete. The pricing would be $15 at the entry level, making it $15 for according to a game journalist's level of skill and play, which take that with a grain of salt, would be an hour and a half worth of story content. This is coming off the announcement of them cancelling the content they had promised their audience, which was despite what weird mental gymnastics you do because the said story missions were always going to cost extra, well that content wasn't supposed to cost anything, and it's not a good look to be charging for it still. It makes it feel like not only did they not deliver on the content and promises that they made, aka failed as a business with their customers, they are still trying to monetize the remnants, instead of doing the moral thing and releasing those for free due to cancelling the majority of the whole reason they announced a second game in the first place. Well, unless they want to argue that, well, it's not because of that and it was actually because of monetization at this point. With moves like this, it's hard not to feel that way, right? And I know the comments are coming regardless of how much logic and non-bootlicking I do. But they could have used the story missions as a moment to write their wrong, right? It's not like we requested and they maybe would do hero mode. No, they promised that they would do it, and they didn't do it. Instead, they found more ways to continue to monetize on the same schedule no matter how utterly tone-deaf they were due to delivering a subpar product that was missing a key feature they promised. Remember, guys, that's who you are defending. Season 5 for Overwatch 2 would continue on June 13th, 2023. This season would finally bring the much-needed competitive matchmaking changes and balancing, such as solo queue players not being placed into multi-queue games. The weird part of Season 5 is despite being a rather good update overall, as it's basically balancing and matchmaking focus, something that should be arguably fixed in a launched product, right? Is Activision Blizzard wanting a pat on the back for bringing back a feature? The on-fire system. Somebody mentioned this in my podcast and I thought it was a joke, but seriously, it's right there on the patch notes. So bug fixes, balancing, matchmaking fixes, wanted for months. Doesn't seem like a good answer to the criticism that the game was facing concerning the content either, though. And then wanting a pat on the back for bringing back a feature that the old version of the game had? Just seemed tone deaf once again. And if anything, it begs the question more and more, how finished was Overwatch 2 really, right? When you're constantly balancing your heroes and after basically slightly overhauling your game in the first place, it speaks to the fact that you either adopted a new vision and are trying to adapt to it, or you lost your lead hero developer and don't have the same vision or eye for things that maybe he did. Whatever it is, still the changes were needed, clearly. But that doesn't do much to help in bringing in new players or even in players who already left. And to me, the thought of getting them to spend $15 for a few hours of story content just seemed like a hard proposition. So perhaps with the failure of PvE before ever launching, Overwatch 2 can still manage to somehow fix its balance issues in the aforementioned issues in competitive play, including a lack of tournaments in the game, and salvage whatever is left of their player base and be a fun alternative team-based shooter to other projects such as CSGO and Valorant and COD, and so on and so forth. But I think that the days of Overwatch being a serious competitor, whether in actual competitive experiences, or merely popularity, are numbered. I mean, that's why I did this video, right? A point that I felt worth mentioning before we transition to solving the case was that the public perception and image of Activision Blizzard was just tarnished at this point. When Overwatch 1 was being developed, not only the team for the team behind it have classic developers that enacted nostalgia and really just belief in the product that they were going to make, the game had that old Blizzard feel still too. With Overwatch 2, Activision Blizzard isn't even the same company. Many of their founders, let alone key developers, have fled the company, and the head honcho in charge is quite hated by many people publicly and behind closed doors. This is going off of hundreds of comments that I received when I asked for fans' perspectives on Overwatch 1 and 2, and Activision Blizzard, and the drama surrounding all of them I got so many examples I couldn't even fit into this video. I mean, for example, shout out to Ool, who talked about NetEase and Blizzard's 14-year relationship falling through. 
or all the other dramatic stories that I was told, like the Blitzchung thing. There's just too many to even fit into this video, sorry guys. And not just from journalists either, but also from diehard passionate fans of the game, expressing their feelings of betrayal that they had for a company that they grew up with, essentially. It's hard to imagine Activision Blizzard being able to effectively or easily transition from this failure without doing some serious house cleaning or reflecting publicly. Because behind the scenes reflecting isn't good enough anymore. If Activision Blizzard wants us to believe that they can still do the same quality, they have to show it to us. But it's disheartening to see so many emails telling me that it's one thing to have them fail at so many hurdles, but it's more that they just can't trust the company themselves to do things morally, ethically, or in the best interest of the game. That is broken trust, and that's a hard thing to mend, and sometimes you never really can. Blizzard really did become Activision Blizzard and then some, the Arthas of their own story. The music is playing and I have spent more time than usual on such a short timeline, but I think we can say that Overwatch 2 was a special case, right? But a case nonetheless. So let's put it to rest. What are the largest contributing factors for the game failing? Blizzard would cancel the hero mode. Overmonetized and underdelivered. The majority of the original and top talent fled. Overwatch 2 is just half-baked. The competitive scene has floundered. Blizzard has tanked their likability past the point that whenever they made new announcements, people were just making memes about it. Overwatch 2 still exists, everybody. I'm well aware of that. And likely will still exist until Activision Blizzard is done squeezing more money out of it. Now, I have no desire to return to that game or don't really see a path forward for them past being quite the niche title. Because I think pulling a Final Fantasy XIV, which is what people constantly echo in my comments anytime a game fails, takes humility in admitting that you messed up, then nothing about Overwatch 2 feels that way. Because then they would have to essentially admit it was done largely for monetization reasons, hence the major degradation in quality and expectation. I'm inclined to believe that some developers would rather leave than even have to talk about that. And they probably did. But I digress, detectives. We must move on to the next case no matter how personally invested into this one we might be. Because games and companies are always dying, and we need to find out why. Thanks for watching. A time shall come when history's greatest warriors will clash on an unending battlefield.